Welcome. We are the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. You might ask yourself, what is quantum optics? It is the research of the interaction of light and matter, which takes place in the macro microcosm or in the quantum cosm. The laser is an integral part of almost all research conducted at the MPQ. The scientists use it as an instrument for research, but the interesting thing is that the laser itself actually is something that follows the rules of quantum mechanics itself. So that is why the coming Saturday is quite important for us, because it is the 60th birthday of the laser. On May 16, 1960, Theodore Maiman, a physicist, got the first laser in the world running. In the beginning, they didn't really know what to do with the laser. It was a solution without a problem, they said. But within a very short time, they have found out that there's a lot of things you can do with it. You can use it for medical diagnostics, you can use it to laser eyes, but moreover, or more importantly, you use it for stuff like this. This would not be possible without the laser, because in the fiberglass, there is a laser and that transforms the, or that transports the information. Light transports information. So, all over the world, on the 16th of May, there will be celebrations of the International Day of Light, and that is what we will celebrate with four lab tours starting basically now. Let me introduce you to our first scientist, Antonio Rubio Abadal. He was born in Palma in Spain. He's 28 years old and has been working for the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics for five years already. So he's been doing a lot of research and he's working for the Quantum Many Body System Division of Emmanuel Bloch. Emmanuel Bloch is currently the managing director of our institute and also a professor and shareholder of the physics department at the, Max, uh, at the I'm sorry, at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Tony, who works for us now, studied at the ETH in Zurich before and before that at the Universidad de Barcelona. He just finished his PhD thesis in April and it was now, behold, probing quantum thermalization and localization of bose hubbard systems. Sounds complicated? It is complicated. It is quite complicated. But I hope Tony will be able to explain it to you. But I want to use or explain one word that has become quite important for me, and that is a boson, because that is what they are doing research on. A boson is something that has a spin, a spin of zero, one or two, like always complete, no half spins. I know, whatever that means, um, but it also is the stuff that glues our matter together and um, we can observe it quite well in lattices of light and um, at very low temperatures where the kinetic energy of the particle decreases to a neglectable amount. So now let me take you into a world for itself the world of ultra cold temperatures. We have places in this lab where it is colder than in the universe. It is almost zero degree, absolute zero. And in the universe, we at least have 2.73 Kelvin, which is minus 270 degrees Celsius or four, minus 454 degree Fahrenheit. It is also the world of atoms trapped in lattices of light. We will not see those lattices, but we will see what they can do on a computer later. And it is also the world of quantum gases with which we can understand materials and also create new forms of matter. But most importantly, as my colleague called it, it is the lab of the thousand mirrors. And I don't think any other lab in this house, in this institute, has as many of those. So it's time to invite us self into our, to invite us into the lab there is the bell let's see if tony opens and i will have to take my mask and let's see hello hello tony welcome everyone to the lab please come in All right, so hello everyone and welcome to, to our lab. Uh, today we'll show you uh, a bit of experiments and try to explain to you uh, the kind of physics that we do in this experiment, which probably uh, Miriam has already introduced to you. So maybe come a bit closer. Um, essentially, 
maybe you have already heard this, we are experiment of ultra cold atoms. This means that we are interested on taking particles that are at high temperatures initially, like in our in this room, for example, and take them to extremely cold. And when we talk about cold, what we really mean is slow. The particles, the atoms, or the molecules that are in this room, they are moving at speeds as fast as an airplane. But for our experiments, we want to observe some quantum effects that only appear when these particles are moving at very few millimeters per second. Now, how do we do this? We do this with laser cooling. That means that we need huge amount set up with a lot of different lasers of different colors. But most of what we have is actually in the infrared. This means that we cannot see it uh, with our own eyes, but that we, use, we need to use some kind of cards or some kind of uh, viewers which allow us to see this laser light in, in new colors in a way. So I will start showing you this box here. This black box is actually an optical table where we have most of the uh, optical setup that we need for the experiment. And let me just take a look and hopefully you can see quite a bit here. So what you're looking at uh, you might be tempted of asking whether this is just where we store all the optics when we are not using them, but this is actually our experiment. Um, those um, blue boxes that we can see there are the lasers, that's where the laser light comes from. And then we use a lot of small mirrors, lenses and other devices to be able to just move this light from one point to the other. In a way, it's not very different from an electrical circuit, but it's just much bigger because we still haven't figured out a way of making these lenses and many other optical elements small enough. And in fact, here I can just quickly show you how I can use this card. You can see a very small uh, red spot or orange spot in my card. I don't know if this is visible. That's exactly the light, for example. And this is usually what we always need to use for aligning the beams and making sure the experiment is working fine. But okay, here I'm mainly talking about lasers, but we should be speaking about atoms and all these the real experiment, the place where really the magic of uh, the quantum world and ultra cold temperatures happens is in this other box that we'll take a look at now. And here we just prepare the light in the right frequency with the right amount of power. And we send it using optical fibers like these cables, some of these blue and yellow cables that we can see around. These just carry the light from Usually we're used to optical fibers going over many, many kilometers to bring you internet, but in this case we just move it from one table to the other one over a few meters. Now, if you follow me, we can take a look from the other side of the table. It's all a new experience doing this uh, lab tour via Instagram, so we are <laughs> excited, but it's also a bit different. I'm happy at least there's not so many people touching the things while I'm speaking, but it's also a different kind of interaction. So let me show you before I open, how does actually our chamber look like? So this is so-called a vacuum chamber. And this is a nice way of saying something that doesn't look very different from a, maybe like a pressure pot in your uh, kitchen. Just that what we do is removing all the air that's inside of this chamber to make sure that there's essentially very, very few atoms. And then that's where we can prepare our experiments with the very cold atoms right in the center of this vacuum chamber. Now, the reason why I show you these pictures instead of directly showing you the setup is the following. I, you can see it's a bit, right now, even myself, I have a bit of difficulty on identifying where the vacuum chamber is because there's just so many, so many optics all around it. This is optics that we're using in the first place to cool the atoms but also to trap them in some specific position or also to take pictures of these atoms so that we can know at which temperature they are and where are they. Nonetheless, I can quickly give you a bit of, a, of an overview of the elements. There we can see there's some region with a bit of aluminum foil. That's what we call the oven and essentially it's just we have some solid rubidium material. So rubidium is one element of the periodic table and we heat it up slightly so that it makes a gas. So we start with a gas of atoms. They are not ultra cold. They're actually pretty warm at the speeds that I was mentioning before. And then we use several lasers from different sites, which essentially make all these particles that are moving fast to start being kicked from all the sites until they essentially don't move at all, which is perfect for the kind of experiments that we want to do. And that happens somewhere in the center of this table. 
I'm not sure if uh, it's in a tip file. So I'm using a green laser, a green normal pointer laser to show uh, the parts that I want to indicate. And that's where all the magic happens. And I know I'm still not giving many details, but when we go to the showing the experimental control, I will be able to explain a bit better which processes do we do and how do we take pictures of these atoms when they are at such cold temperatures. There was just one question. How do optics cool down the atoms? Yes, so that's, it doesn't sound straightforward, the idea that a laser makes things cooler instead of hotter, because we know lasers can be used in many cases just to heat up elements. But the main idea is if you think of the atoms as just tiny uh, particles, just as a billiard ball that's moving around at a high speed, you can use light in a direction which goes opposite to the velocity of these atoms, such that it gets slower and slower. Now you might ask, how do you know which direction the atoms have? Well, to make sure that they are cooled in all directions, we need lasers with different frequencies coming from six different directions. And this makes a very small cloud of cold atoms in the center. Hope more or less that gives the idea. Maybe if we have any more questions about this, but otherwise I could move to the experiment control and give a bit more detail of the kind of stuff that we're doing. As you can see, it's quite complex and we need, since the beams need to go also vertically, horizontally, that's why we need all these different uh, what we call breadboards. All right? Then let's close. The reason why this is so closed, it's in the first place because it's high power lasers, some of them. Now they were all off, so don't worry, you viewers of Instagram. But also because we want to ensure that no dust enters and that the temperature is very stable. All these small elements that we see, if they change the temperature, this could make the laser uh, direction slightly drift and this could make all our experiments not work at all. So this is why we need very good um, air conditioning systems that ensure that our temperature fluctuates by a very small amount. All right, then, <laughs> I don't, okay. <laughs> now, all these, uh, while all these elements that I've showed, most of the time we try to not touch them too much and not to have to, uh, directly work with them, but rather we use computer which uh, can take care of controlling a huge amount of all the different elements that we have in the lab. And just to get an idea, a single computer for it to be able to control the hundreds of different elements that we have in the lab, those are all the cables that we need. And for example are used to change the frequency or the color of a laser, change the power, these kind of things. Now maybe we can <laughs> take a seat if this will make it a bit easier to explain. And this is how it looks. Um, the process of taking the atoms from normal room temperature to the coldest temperatures of the universe takes roughly 20 seconds, which sounds like a short time, but at the same time, it means that it takes quite a bit to every time uh, make these experiments that we do. And these are all the parts. So you can think of what I'm showing here as a chronology of all the things, all the pulses, all the different parts, porting them from one part of the chamber to the other one, then illuminating them, and so on. All right? And that's the whole idea. It's just hundreds of channels as the ones that I showed there. Each one of these colors correspond to some of the elements that I showed in the table. Now, what are we trying to do? I talked mainly, and probably Miriam already introduced, that we try to do ultra atoms to study new phases of matter. What uh, we in particular do is also use lasers to make these so-called optical lattices. And maybe to try to explain this a bit better, I have a few slides that can uh, help you all viewers to get a feeling about this. But of course, interrupt me at any time if you have. So we start with a cloud that could look like something like this, as I showed before. So that red piece of cloud are cold atoms glowing at, uh, with an infrared light, which can be detected by a camera. And we have to prepare them somewhere. And we can use lasers not only to cool them, but also to trap them. So imagine I just have a single laser beam, uh, which illuminates some region of the chamber. The atoms, if the parameters are the right ones, will get trapped inside this laser beam. And this is a bit like just taking eggs and putting them inside a basket, all right? And the idea of optical lattices is that if instead of one laser beam, I put two laser beams, 
they will generate what's called an interference pattern, which maybe you're familiar already from some other context. This means that here we will have light, here we will not have anything, and so on. And then the atoms will only get trapped into these red regions which are illuminated, all right? And this, the analogy that we always do in our field of cold atoms in optical lattices is taking an egg cardboard. So now you, you could even think something a bit like this. You just have um, some device that looks like an egg cardboard. And if each one of these white balls uh, was an individual atom, then they just get trapped in some particular place of this egg cardboard. So I don't know. This is just preparing a cold sample of atoms could look something like this. And that's essentially what we're doing all the time in the experiment, all right? And you don't have to believe me that this is the case, but actually, on top of that, something which is exciting about our experiment is that we, can, we have a microscope. That means we have placed a very high-quality objective, similar to the ones that you would have in a normal uh, camera. We place it right below, to the in, below the atoms, and this allows us to take pictures of each individual atom in its position in this optical lattice. And just to, so that, uh, to get a feeling, that's how one of those pictures looks like. In fact, this computer that we have here behind is the one taking care of uh, taking all these different pictures, where we can also see, but let me just mainly show this one here. And each one of the atoms will emit thousands of photons, so a lot of light, that will be collected by this objective, and we will be able to then say, okay, we know that there was an atom sitting in this particular position of our system, or somewhere else, and so on. All right? I think here we can, yeah. So which ones are the single atoms? Yes, uh, maybe I can use a pen, hopefully this doesn't. Here it's quite easy to see this red dot that we see, mm -hmm. that's an individual atom. Those white dots are just artificially, it's something I put afterwards. Those are the positions in which each atom can get trapped, similar to this example that I was giving. And here we can see that we have a lot of atoms next to each other, and it's a bit more difficult to know where does one atom start and the other, just because the light coming from each one of them uh, gets mixed with each other. And the nice thing about having an objective is not only that we can see the atoms, but also that we can send another laser beam to change their state, to manipulate them. And in a way, instead of manipulating them, I like more to think of it as drawing. So imagine you just start with a very cold cloud that we have prepared when we have only one atom in each one of these sites that I was showing. And we can use that laser to paint this X in a egg cardboard and make, for example, some artificial shapes. Like, for example, here we prepared, we took the atoms and we placed them in a Pac-Man shape just uh, for the fun of it. This usually that we know so far it's not useful for any scientific reason, but we are sure that this will be important in the next years. And many other kind of uh, shapes that we can create initially. Now, I don't know what you think about this, but probably one say, wow, it's so exciting that you can draw with individual atoms, but this sounds pretty useless or pointless. Why are we doing this aside from the fact that it's fundamentally beautiful to do something like this? And that's a, there are several answers to that question. But something that we are trying very often to do is not understanding how X behave in a cardboard, but something that also looks very similar to our atoms in an optical lattice are electrons in real crystals. So for example, the semiconductor that's inside this phone that's recording me now uh, is made out of crystal where the electrons have to move in a very precise way to be able to give us all the modern electronics that we know. And that requires a good understanding of the quantum mechanics of individual electrons. Here, even though we're not working with electrons, we're working with atoms, we can also make them behave quantum by taking them at these cold temperatures. And if we understand a bit better how the atoms behave, maybe we can use that to build better materials in the future. And um, yes, that's a bit uh, the basic idea. Can I extend a bit about this, but uh, maybe if, uh, I don't know if I should Give some time. You like Pac-Man? Did you do the Pac-Man? <laughs> I didn't do the Pac-Man. This was a previous, yeah. I was a bit uh, sorry that I didn't come up with the idea before, but I've done a lot of other shapes, uh, most of them sometimes. Um, it's, of course, what, one, what we can draw is a bit limited to what uh, 
the number of atoms that you start and so, but there's a lot of different things. And for example, there we have an example of a picture we took also some years ago, which is the Greek letter C, the one in the left. And well, usually in quantum mechanics, I know psychologists probably also use there in the context, but it's also the symbol of quantum mechanics. And each one of those, well, yeah, that's just made of individual atoms, this Greek letter. So. What do I see on this picture? Is that what just happened? So, it depends on which. Here we have several pictures. Again, now, because the high power lasers are off, we don't have the experiment running continuously, but usually we'd have a picture every 20 seconds and we would just look at it and see what's going on. And this picture that I'm showing here, for example, is very similar to, to this cold cloud that I, uh, that I showed you before in my computer. Um, the atoms are so close together that you just see some kind of yellow shape because you cannot tell where. But you can see these red dots here. Uh, some of them are out of the cloud. You can see those in the edge. And we have also some uh, empty sites. Aside from that, there's different pictures. This is something my uh, lab colleagues were taking some time ago, uh, trying to align some of the beams. But uh, wow. there you cannot see the individual atoms because it's just a cloud of a lot of atoms uh, fluorescing. So another question that has been asked is, um, do we use all of this for quantum information and quantum computing? I guess it depends on what you include inside quantum information and quantum computing. It's not the only direction. As I was mentioning before, we would like to understand how electrons move in real materials, but this is very difficult to simulate. It would require computers extremely hard. The best supercomputers in the world have trouble doing this. But our atoms do it kind of naturally just because we prepare them there and they already do that. So this is what some people refer to as a quantum simulator. We can simulate those electrons by looking at the atoms. And even though quantum computers are still a bit far, we are still not ready to have something that really can give us uh, very useful uh, results. Our experiments can already give us much understanding in some important problems of uh, quantum physics and condensed matter. So tell us a little bit more about your research. It's been about temperature, and I think, have we seen where the temperature is going super low in those things? Like, where is the coldest spot in your lab? The coldest spot, so before I showed the picture of a vacuum chamber, right in the center of that vacuum chamber, we have this coldest point of the universe, let's say. Um, and to make it clear, what's very difficult about having things so cold is not only making them cold, but keeping them cold. For example, if we just take some ice out of our fridge, we know it will melt after a while, just because the whole kitchen is at a much higher temperature. In a similar way, if we were to place the atoms in contact with some other material, uh, they would get hotter. So they could not be at such cold temperatures. But because we use lasers, the atoms can in a way be levitating in the middle of nowhere, or in the middle of our chamber, and they are not directly coupled to the rest of this room, which is at much hotter temperatures. So that's a bit the idea. It's, it's very remarkable that we can have our atoms for many seconds being still extremely cold, even though they are in a room much hotter than that. And that just works because lasers are very good at isolating those atoms from the rest of the room. That's a bit uh, a simple explanation. And this is, for example, being able to keep the atoms for such long times without them getting hotter is very important for the work that I did, for example, in my PhD uh, thesis, which essentially consisted in preparing the state, the atoms initially in some, some called out of equilibrium state. This just means we prepare the atoms in a weird state where they, let's say, they don't want to be in. And then we wait for some time to see how they move and how they reach thermal equilibrium. This is something I, I like to give this uh, simple example. Sorry. <laughs> um, for example, when we go to a cafe, I don't know when it was the last time you guys went to a cafe, it's been a while for me, um, and we get some uh, uh, cappuccino with some very fancy shape in our cafe, and then if we wait for enough time, we don't see that shape anymore. So we have to make sure we take that picture and post it in Instagram before it's too late. We do something similar with our atoms. We take them, a similar state like the one I was showing before, and maybe we suddenly remove all the atoms in some parts to make some kind of pattern, and then we wait for some time and we see how this equilibrates. So while it might look like I'm just doing the same experiment that you do when you get a cappuccino in a cafe, what's different is that our atoms follow the rules of quantum mechanics instead of just the classical mechanics that particles in a coffee would be following. That's a, a bit of a short idea.
Um, so there's two questions. One question is, so you can use atoms and lasers in the equipment to model the universe? Well, to model some, I mean, at the end of the day, all the universe is made of particles that obey the laws of quantum mechanics. This means that there's a lot of very different systems. I talked a lot about electrons in materials, but many other materials, like for example, neutron stars, where we can also try to understand much better how the systems work by simulating our atoms. And this sounds a bit confusing because neutron stars are way at extremely hot temperatures, while our atoms are extremely cold. But physics is such that sometimes systems which are very different energy scales can behave following the same rules, which in this case is quantum mechanics. And it turns out that people working with um, some specific species of atoms, they can learn a lot about this kind of materials like neutron stars, because they are both fermions, which is one card of particles uh, in the quantum world. The other and one opposite to the bosons. Which exactly. In fact, our yeah. experiments, I didn't mention this, but they are bosons. We work, this all depends on which isotope of some specific element you're working. We're working with rubidium 87, and this is a boson which in a short way means that bosons try to get a bit closer together and they uh, like being next to each other, while fermions, they tend to have some natural repulsion. And in fact, electrons are fermions while my atoms are bosons. There's still a lot that you can learn uh, about even working with bosons. I have a question about light here. So I would say let's go back to one of those beautiful boxes with sure. the optics so we can see let's some see of that, that because they are just too cool to look at. Mm -hmm. Because the question is, do you use the same kind of laser for light generation and for controlling the temperature of atoms? I need to, so I'm, I'm not completely sure what's the difference here between light generation and controlling the temperature. So there's really a lot of different processes and in general there will be different lasers. What I can tell you very well is that if I want to take a picture of an atom, what we do is we send light of a certain color that's resonant with this atom and then we wait for it to make fluorescence that we can collect. This light is the same one we use for cooling it. So you can use the same laser for cooling and for taking pictures of the atoms. The third thing that I showed today was trapping the atoms and for that we need a different frequency. That would be my shortest summary. But it's true that in our experiment they are all infrared. If instead of working with rubidium, you're working with lithium or with cesium, you might have a different colors. And there's a lot of other uh, labs that have a much uh, nicer palette of colors in their setup. In our case, we happen to be lucky or unlucky that they're all infrared. That's why I was stressing at the beginning that we need all these elements like these uh, infrared cards to be able to see our lasers. So it's a bit technical, but we work with 7, 80 nanometers, which is more... Uh, lower frequencies than red color and then with 1064 nanometers which is much farther away but both of them are invisible to the eyes of humans another question can you conduct quantum logic gates encoded in these atomic state arrangements the short answer would be yes but the long answer is well for what and for how long I, I, our atoms behave quantum but of course they don't behave quantum forever I said we can have them be in quantum for quite a few seconds. The real question is if you want to, for example, make a computer out of our atoms, you need to compare how long these atoms remain quantum and how fast you do all these uh, gates or logic, quantum logic that this question was talking about. So in general, it could be that these gates are slow enough so that by the time that we have asked the atoms or prepared the atoms in an interesting state, it could already be too late for that. This is a similar problem in all, all the other kinds of experiments with ions or with superconducting circuits. And some have some strengths and some have other uh, weaknesses. So my short answer is yes, it can be done. There's a lot of theoretical work done about this and also a few experimental things. But um, to be able to, for example, process some uh, or give a very interesting answer to some complicated problem, it might take uh, much more development of the technology. Then the next question. Yes. What happens if the beam path gets misaligned somewhere unreachable? Do you just add another pair of mirrors or compensate that? Or to compensate that? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. And maybe 
I, I know it's very nice to look at it, but let's take a look at this breadboard we have here because I can touch it without <laughs> damaging our experiment. The mirrors are not just like a mirror which is in a fixed position, but they usually come with the screws that we see here. All right, I don't know how visible this is, but this is a mirror. This is just a, it's not a setup. They are just uh, stored here. And by rotating this screw, I can change the direction in which the laser is going. So for example, like this, I will move the laser beam horizontally and like that I will change it vertically. So my short answer is there's no need to put another pair of two mirrors. I can carefully control with my hands these screws and then align the atoms. I, sorry, align the laser beam with whatever we want to align it. This will also depend a lot. Here in this table the lasers need to be aligned with these fibers, these blue and yellow cables I showed before, because we need the light to enter there and be transmitted to the other side in the other table, what's important is that those lasers are aligned with the atoms. And that's much harder because the atoms are in a very tiny space of very few micrometers. And for that, sometimes, even as humans, we are not so good at doing this thing that I showed just now. So for example, you can see we even try to put these stickers here to have a better feeling <laughs> of how we're moving them. But the level of precision that this requires sometimes uh, means that we need to use electronically controlled mirrors. This means that we just have a small motor that already chooses a very tiny amount of uh, change in the position of the mirror. So, so that what most people that see all this ask at one point is, but how do you know where you have to do something? How do yes. you know which one is missing? It's, it's, it's a question that we get almost every time that we make a, a lab tour. Um, so I wondered myself uh, when I came here for the first time and also probably during my first year of PhD, I wondered the same question. But after a while you start to realize that uh, there's a lot of things that you can look at to know exactly what is the problem. So I'm showing a lot the elements that we have, but we also have a lot of screens which are showing us, for example, the intensity of the lasers, the amount of atoms that we have in some part of the setup. So for example, if now the experiment is not working, the first thing I will ask myself is what's going on? Are the atoms not getting cold enough? Are they just not there? And then I say, okay, I don't find the atoms. Then maybe the laser that's cooling the atoms is not working. Okay, let's look at the laser. No, it's here. I can see it. Okay. So, of course, this looks like a lot of optics, but essentially there's like seven or eight big modules here. So if I know that the laser that's cooling the atoms is not there anymore, I know that I have to come to this part of the experiment. Then I can come with this card that I showed before, put it and say, ah, here is where the problem is. So I can tell you that the most common problems or it's like a frequently asked questions, when the experiment doesn't work, there's usually four or five very typical things that we know are likely to be wrong. When we have gone through this and we still don't know what the problem is, then it's a bit harder. And there's days that we just come on Monday morning and suddenly one of our lasers just died for no reason. And this can take a while to figure out if we're not tracking everything correctly. There's another really nice question. All right. What's the approximate path of length that the light takes on the table? It's, it's a hard, I mean, it depends on the laser. Um, typically, for example, in this table, of course, since we have fibers every now and then, <laughs> I can talk about the distance until the fiber, the distance after the fiber, and so on. In this table, for example, as we can, it can easily be several meters. It can be that the light of the laser comes from one of those uh, blue boxes, then it gets reflected several times for one meter, then it gets coupled into a fiber, then the fiber goes out somewhere else, then we reflect it two meters more. I don't know, if I had to guess, probably the longest lasers in our setup are maybe 10 meters or something like that. And this, you might say, it seems like this makes it much harder because then a very small change in the first mirror that you have could completely misalign your laser. But that's also one of the reasons why you use optical fibers. Using optical fibers is very nice because whatever happens in this table, let's say whatever misalignment you do here stays here. I'm not, I don't have to afterwards realign the atoms just because the light of the fiber, the light coming out of the fiber doesn't care of in which angle did it enter on the other side? That's a, a bit of a simple, it's a way of disconnecting the problems. So in general, it's not so hard. We try to have the lasers not much more than a few meters. Another question. How comes the atoms are not damaged by the laser? And that's right, lasers are, are dangerous mm -hmm. as well. Let's see, so 
aside from all the measures of now wearing masks, in our lab we always wear some of these goggles for precisely this reason. Just because we cannot see the light doesn't mean it cannot damage our eyes. And these are quite dangerous wavelengths because since you don't see them, you don't realize when they are, for example, burning some part of your eye. Now, but this is a bit different with individual atoms. My eyes, it's true that they are made of molecules or of atoms, but they are forming some kind of structure. For example, let's think about DNA that's inside our body. That's some very complicated structure. Uh, chemists and biologists, you know more than this than me. If we use a laser, we could destroy the structure of DNA, and then we will not have any more uh, the information that we had there. But the individual atoms of our DNA or the individual molecules might still be fine. So the short answer will be atoms are quite robust to laser. That's a very natural thing for them. It's just when they form complicated structures like cardboard, paper, that can actually be destroyed by a laser, the structure, but not the individual atoms. At least not with our lasers. If you had a gamma ray uh, laser, then maybe you would be able to destroy the nuclear structure of an atom, but this is not what we do here. And how many atoms are in your probe that you are cooling? This, um, okay, this is a, let's see. Initially we can prepare hundreds of thousands of atoms, all right? But usually to take these pictures I was showing you before, we don't have more than 200 or 300. One of the reasons is because the way we get them colder is by removing the hot atoms. This sounds a bit trivial, but we start with a big cloud and we tell all the cloud, all the hot atoms go away and only the cold atoms stay, such that at the end we have a very cold thing. And as I was mentioning, in our experiment can easily be 200 or 300. We could in principle put more, but then we need lasers more powerful. And right now my colleagues are working very hard to make our lasers bigger and more powerful so that we can increase our atom number for 300 to maybe 3000, which could be very important for all these applications I mentioned before of quantum computation, quantum simulation, and so on. There is a question about entanglement. Oh. Is there any aspect of entanglement observable within these setups? Mm -hmm. Maybe we look through that one just to look through it. Okay, it at is least. So nice. <laughs> look at this one, the thousand years before we move over to the question. We give a bit of time to the speaker to think about the question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move the other one. All right, so you can leave it open for the moment, it's fine. Um, yes, I guess we can take from the same side. I don't know if there could be much to yeah, be won. I'll come here. All right. Hello there. So that's a, a very good question, and I don't know uh, <laughs> what kind of uh, audience do I have, how many are familiar with quantum entanglement, but quantum entanglement is just one of the properties that make quantum physics so exciting and so different from normal classical uh, mechanics. And again, there's a short answer to the question, yes. I think what's in many experiments of quantum physics hard is to see this entanglement. We have no doubt, there's no discussion that our atoms are entangled because they are a bunch of cold atoms. They are thousands of them sometimes. They are interacting with each other because they are colliding and this generates entanglement. The problem, what's a bit harder in our experiments is to be able to identify and faithfully measure this entanglement. So that would be a bit my answer. Definitely, and we have some experiments in which we actually have made huge progress in probing and understanding quantum entanglement but in general, when you have thousands or even more atoms, it's very difficult to identify those properties because they get blurred within a chaotic cloud of uh, atoms. So if you work with very few atoms, it's much easier to see uh, this entanglement. And in our experiment, we have several uh, measurements in which this has been done. So we prepare all the atoms nicely, not entangled at the beginning. Then we allow them to speak only, for example, to their neighbors and later we probe them to see that indeed we had generated uh, quantum entanglement. So another question. How is the probe manufactured? I think we are kind of on the right spot for that as well. Are they mm. all individual atoms on a probe or do they form some kind of bond which would be entanglement again? Um, okay, I'm, I'm not completely sure what they mean by the probe here. So to probe these things, we, to be clear, and since this is something I have not mentioned, we use normal cameras, right? At the end of the day, we have our system. We send light. The light goes to a camera, uh, very expensive but very similar camera to the one in this phone. 
and that's how we see the pictures of the atoms. If your question is concerning the atoms themselves, so our system, um, once again, the question was whether the... How is the probe manufactured? I, I find it... I, I'm not completely sure if manufacture refers to what I do here in the experiment or to the person in maybe China that fabricated the, the elements that we use. So it's what basically the gas that is formed, right? That's yes, the gas that is formed is manufactured by ourselves by choosing these lasers. And again, I have also showed you that we can change the shapes of our lasers to make these fancy shapes like Pac-Man's. And this is controlled from the computer by ourselves. And then the atoms just end up sitting there individually. They are, they are still individual atoms. They are not forming any bond with themselves. And in fact, if we make these lattices that I showed earlier very strong, the atoms pretty much don't speak to each other. They're in a very boring, in a way, boring state because they are not entangled. And then, yes, so that's, I would say we can either prepare them in a state where they are all speaking to each other and we can have interesting state of matters like Bose-Einstein condensates, superfluids, and so on. Or we can prepare them in states where essentially each atom is individual and doesn't care about all the other ones. That's my short. So it depends on the experiment that we do. Thank you. Please save this live one over. We will, for sure. It's going on YouTube. But some last views. Any more questions? Any one more question? Sure, sure, stay here. Otherwise, tell me if it's about you to think if there's anything else you'd like to tell. Well, I mainly thank you for listening and I hope you were able to learn or maybe get interested. Uh, especially a message to young students which are maybe interested in studying uh, physics or, or uh, working in these labs. Uh, once this whole corona thing is out, there will be for sure opportunities to come in person to the lab. And we're always happy to have uh, new future uh, research uh, uh, coming to visit us. <laughs>